Okay, we're back. We're live. It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday afternoon at 2 o'clock, and we're doing Hawaii, the state of health. Okay, and that is a double entendre, of course. We have Jessica Woolley. She's the director of OEQC, and I happen to know what that means. It's the Office of Environmental Quality Control. Right. And uh, she's the director. And uh, Les Segundo, he is a planner at OEQC, part of state government. We're going to find out everything it does. Oh, <laughs> environmental health specialist. Environmental, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm that's right okay. That oh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> I, I don't want to, you know, insult okay. the planners. So that connects it all up, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so uh, we're going to call this an insider view at OEQC. We're going to learn things we didn't know before. So welcome to the show, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to have you here. The day, last time I saw you, you were sitting in office as the chair of the Agriculture Committee in the state legislature. Yep. And I wanted to ask you, I've been burning to ask you this question, so how is life different? It's very different on this side of the table, actually. In some ways, more challenging and in some ways, much easier. I think one of the best things is the staff and the office, you know, really works well together. But it's very different being on the executive side versus yeah. the legislative side. Very different. Well, congratulations. Thank you, know. you. Thank you. In some ways, this is more the real world. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay, so the next thing is, what does, uh, since we're going to do an insider view of OEQC, what is it? I mean, it's, I know it's the Office of Environmental Quality Control, but what does it do? Where does it fit in the state architecture, governmental architecture? Well, very good question, and it actually has two kind of primary functions. One of them is under HRS 341, and that's very general about the environment. And so we are the agency that is supposed to educate, uh, recommend, and address environmental issues. And the other part is HRS 343, and that's really what we're better known for, and I think what we have that's ended up... That's the Hawaii up Environmental Protection Act. That's right the environmental review process. So a lot of our energy has ended up focused on that. It is our mandate and something that really needs to happen if projects are going to go forward. And because of a lot of budget cuts, we have ended up over the many years just focusing, I think, much more on the 343, 343. process. 343. Yeah. It has to be done. Yeah. Okay. Now, I remember, and I have a limited memory, you'll see. Me too. <laughs> I remember that OEQC was supposed to facilitate and help people who are stuck in environmental quandary, in, in environmental quicksand. Mm -hmm. um, is that still so? It is. Well, part of it is under the environmental review process. Uh, essentially, applicants and agencies have to come to us to request that we publish notification of their documents if they need to go through the process. And so a lot of times people just need to know how it works. And so, yeah, a primary part of our job is to make sure that those folks, whether it's agencies or applicants, are able to get through the process. And also if the public needs assistance learning about the process. I think one of the hopes that we have for today is that we can help people understand better how if you're a member of the public, why this is relevant to you. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So how big a staff do you have to do this, uh, what I consider extremely important work? Total is five in our office, five. including me. We need more, I can tell you We that do right need now. more, yeah. yeah. For many years, actually, we it was 10 more. or 11. 10 or 11 was the traditional uh, staff. Yeah. Where's your office? It is at the State Office Tower, the Leo Papa building, mm -hmm. the okay. seventh floor. Now, one of the staff, this is a rumor only, one of the staff is sitting here. Les Segundo. <laughs> Am I right about that? And he is a uh, environmental health uh, specialist. planner. Specialist. Specialist. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> what is an environmental health specialist? Well, actually, the field, the, the title, the job title encompasses a lot of different things. Uh, most environmental health specialists actually work with the regulatory agencies. They have some in the Department of Labor that work with the Occupational Safety and Health Program. Uh, they also have, in the health department, they work uh, primarily to enforce regulations. Yeah, So they go out and do inspections to see if they're complying with environmental laws. And the other thing, too, is that in my case, you know, I was also, I did inspections, but I also was the, the hazardous was hazard, excuse me, hazardous waste permit writer for the state, yeah? And that was before I went to OEQC. So 
it encompasses a wide range of activities. So, you know, generally uh, we try to, the requirements are that you need a science background, but you know, other than that, they don't train you to do, do, to do the job because you need to kind of read the statute, read the rules and understand the program, understand the people that are being regulated too. So it was, it's a very interesting field, yeah. Yeah, so you're, you're actually involved in, in, as a regulator in examining whether people are in compliance well, with environmental not laws? not so much now because... It's different. My, it's changed. My, yeah. I guess I get that from what you're saying. Yeah, my, my, my position actually, historically what happened was long ago, Jessica mentioned that, you know, we had basically uh, two tracks, yeah, of action that we have. The 343 track, which is the Environmental Policy Act, yeah, which is... Formerly, there was this thing called the Environmental Quality Commission, which was a part of the governor's office. Mm -hmm. And they were the ones that set forth these rules. And then there was also the 341 track, which involves environmental policy itself. And that was also a part of the governor's office. And that the Environmental Council was an integral part of that. And the director of the OEQC was also the chair of the council long, long ago. And so what happened was in 1983, I guess the powers that be decided that they didn't want to have an environmental agency that was, you know, in the governor's office that had all this power. So they basically broke the Environmental Co Quality Commission up and transferred the responsibilities of the commission to both OEQC and the Environmental Council, which exists today. Mm, so yeah. you have an Environmental Council, um, but you don't have an Environmental Center. What is the difference, and why did the well, Environmental Center go away? Well, that is a very good question, and if you go on the internet, you actually will find the Environmental Center, but in reality, you won't find anybody there. So I think it's a lot about, you know, funding and politics, and the unfortunate part is that I think as a result, we've lost that part of kind of the academic and research and innovative uh, commentary that would often happen in the environmental review process when they were functioning. So we don't have that now. I think also to some extent because of our staff reductions, the government side of that doesn't really happen. And that's why the public is so important. Yes. Because they're really the only ones that, I mean, the part of the process, the initial vision was to focus on the role of the public and being part of the planning process. And now as a result of reality and budget cuts, that's the essence of the law, really. Yeah, that's, you know, that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's too bad because, in fact, you know, uh, designing policy around environment is so critical to the state. And if you don't do that, it has a life of its own, and maybe it's a life that you, you know, that isn't thoughtful. Um, I, I wonder, for example, you know, we had this thing, we're still having it, I suppose, with uh, Carlton Ching and DLNR. Is his name still in front of the, uh, the Senate for confirmation? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. I mean, he's a nice guy, yep. reasonable man, smart man, well educated, well educated in the way things work in Hawaii. Um, so I'm not sure what the big fuss is, but but you know what I get out of it is that DLNR pretty much is not impartial in environmental matters. It is an advocating organization. It always takes the constrain the development and preserve the environment. Always takes that position. I can tell you, I, I practiced in front of it. I could say, cite names and cases if you like. But, <clears throat> so that, that's one agency that I know of. And the Department of Health, which is much more moderate on such issues, much more, you know, impartial, I think, uh, is another agency that is concerned with the environment. Hence, you know, we're here on the show called Hawaii, the State of, of Health. Um, are there any others beside you guys? Or is, is, have I named everybody who has, you know, involvement with the environment? I would say DBED also. Mm -hmm. They have the CZM, Coastal Zone Management Program, and Office of Planning. So they also have a big role. There are actually a lot land, of... Land Use Commission. Land Use Commission. Yeah. There's actually, sure. we're, we're scattered in many ways, you know, oh. the, the focus. And part, sometimes a mandate, like for mm -hmm. DLNR, they have a very diverse mandate. And for us, we have a mandate to focus on the environment, but in recognition of the economy. So we're always very focused on the two. And that's why you facilitate 
you help people. We help both. We help everybody. The brambles there. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. And that's really important to to the economy. That's right. Because if we if we had everybody advocating for environment over development, we'd have no development. Mm -hmm. so if we didn't have two hands clapping, we need two hands clapping. Right. So this Our, is that's right. Refreshing to hear this actually. Mm -hmm. So, um, but let's 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 go now. Um, to the way in which you operate. So you don't have the Environmental Center, but you have the Commission. And the, the Council, the Environmental Council. Council, Council sorry. Yeah, that's okay. And let me just take a minute to explain that. Yeah. So that is the Advisory Board on the Environment. And so, like us, they used to be attached to the Governor's Office, and now they are also attached to the Department of Health. And they are obligated to advise the Governor, and thus all executive agencies, as well as the Legislature on environmental issues. It's an advisory board, appointed members, 15. Okay, advisory means just that, eh? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes. They can come around and give you advice. They have a statute, uh, also a statutory responsibility which they inherited from the old Environmental Quality Commission, and that they, they are the entity that makes the rules to implement the EIS process. Which can make, be us. They, yeah. In other words, the they, advisory board makes the rules? That's, no. well, yes. go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's, 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 um, it's part of their role is to advise and potentially promulgate the rules. Okay. Yeah. And, and the rules have to be approved by, rules they come up with have to be approved by? The governor. The governor. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's that's very important because 343 is a, what shall I say a thicket, and uh, you know I mean, there was all this discussion as much as three four years ago. In fact, uh, Denise Antolini of the law school was appointed to look into, and others in the university were appointed by uh, I'm not sure if it was Lingo or Abercrombie, but appointed to rewrite or at least recommend the rewrite of 343. But it, it, it fell into, um, I want to say, disagreement about what should happen, so nothing happened. And 343 is still 343. And I, is it fair to say everybody agrees it should be, it should be rewritten, but it hasn't been? Fair to say I that. think so. And I think also there is a need for the rules to be revised. And, you know, what the Environmental Council has been trying to do that, but one of the other elements is they don't have any budget and they don't have any staff. So we are able to help them, but the last time the rules were addressed was, I think, 1998? 97. 97. Yeah. So we the, need to do it again. And you took this job. I know. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, they this need a very me. difficult they need, area. They need somebody. Yeah. yeah. Well, you did it out of, out of, out of your heart. <laughs> I, I must say, you know, uh, as I said before, the environment is so critically important in an island state with an environment that is, um, you know, degrading while we watch in so many ways. It has to be protected. We should be spending much more money on this. This is a, it's one of those unfunded liabilities is what it is. It's a huge liability, but no money. <laughs> well, you know, <clears throat> I just had lunch with somebody who told me, don't worry, Jay, you know, the, the, the economy is going great. Real estate is going good. Everybody's buying condos. And uh, so there should be more money in the, in the till. Uh, Kirk Colwell recognizes that he's going to, you know, raise rates on real property tax, and that would work fine for the city. But I don't know about the state. We'll see. You need more money. We need more money. Yeah. So let's talk about getting the public involved because this is what you wanted to talk about. And in order to ramp up to that, I guess the first I would ask, you know, what is the line of authority for you as director, Jessica? Uh, what is what? You know, who do you control? What powers do you have? Well, when it comes to the environmental review process, our primary function is procedural. So we are accepting documents from agencies or applicants who have a proposal, and then we publish it in the environmental notice, which comes out every two weeks. How do I get it? Uh, well, rain or shine, uh, you can go to the website and sign up. Uh, if you go to the bottom right corner, mm -hmm. uh, we now have the capacity electronically to sign you up and then you will automatically receive it every two weeks. Okay, and, and the website is oeqc. oeqc.doh.hawaii.gov. Department of Health. Yeah. How excellent. So you are administratively attached to the Department of Health. That's correct. How oh, excellent. That's good, you know, that's good. Um, okay, so um, now they, they, as director, what, what are you, what are you, can, can you make, can you flog people? Can you? I can. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends on the 
depends on the person. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> no, um, so, so a lot of our role is advice. We're not, you know, and, and 343 itself, the environmental review process, is very much a procedure. It's not a caveat, you know, you, you get this or you don't, um, based on my decision. There, usually, there is an agency that has to approve the final document when it comes to, you know, something that goes through the environmental review process. Which is? Uh, it depends on the on the agency. Oh, I see. It, it could depends be, on yeah, it could what, be, what agency it's going through. Yeah, it could okay. be a county agency, it could be a state agency. And so part of our job is to advise all of those agencies on how they go through the process. But once they give us the document and we publish it, there for, for many of the documents there's a public comment period. And that's where the, the public is so important. So there's only 30 days. What, what is the 30 days? How does that work? Well, it's for most documents. There are some that are 45 days. But for most environmental yeah. review documents, it's 30 days. And so as soon as we publish the notice, we indicate the date. And then for 30 days, the public has the opportunity to tell the agency or the uh, applicant mm -hmm. what they think or if they have any questions. So it's their opportunity to have a conversation with the proponent of the project. So this is during the 30-day period. Mm -hmm. And then what? Finish. So after the 30 days, uh, essentially the applicant or the agency has to respond to the comments, the public comment. And then that becomes another document, a final document that is then published so people can see what the comments were and how they responded. And after that, um, there is a period of time, uh, and then it is to the, up to the final agency to make that final approval. Yeah. The, so how it, long does you get the, to rebut the comments that are received in the first 30 days? There's no we formal. Don't do that. Yeah. There's no formal rebuttal process. It's all judicial. There is no rebuttal. Yeah. Process. So yeah. administratively, once the comment period is over, the agency makes a determination as to whether there's a significant effect, which requires, which basically entails a FONSI finding of no significant impact, okay. or there's significant effect, which means that an EIS will be prepared. So the EIS, of course, is the first document that kind of like begins this long process by which the public gets more details as to what, what, what the impacts and the mitigations and the alternatives are for this particular project. I am so excited to be able to actually talk to you guys about exactly what an EIS is how you do it, what it means, how it, you know, the power that it has or it doesn't. And um, I, got, I got to wind up my questions, mm -hmm. so we take a short break to allow me to do that. Okay. And then for the next 15 minutes, we're going to delve into EIS. Okay. I've been waiting. Great. This discussion. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll be right back. You'll see. Okay. Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm the host of a program called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm a physician. I work in the emergency department on the Big Island. I also serve in the state senate, which please don't hold that against me, doesn't detract from my television program. We speak about all the big health care issues in the state. We get together on Tuesdays from 2 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we try to talk about the most important issues in health care. This is a terrific venue for people to learn about health care. There are many programs on this on this station. We broadcast it later, uh, not just on the internet, but also on OC16. Thanks for joining us. Please be informed healthcare consumers. Hi, aloha. My name is Chris Leatham, and I have a host a show called The Economy and You. Uh, the show plays every Wednesday at noon. And on my show, I bring on guests who are interested or working in the technology space. And uh, so I'd like you to come and watch the show and learn with me about all the sort of exciting things that we're doing in Hawaii to build and grow our economy ecosystem. So I'd like to say aloha, and I look forward to seeing you on the show. Thank you. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here on a given Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday. <laughs> With, uh, Jess. I was it's already such March, a good time. right? I forgot where I was. <laughs> uh, Jessica Willey, Director of OEQC, which stands for Officer of Environmental Quality Control, and Les Segundo, who is an uh, Environmental Health Specialist at OEQC. And we're learning about OEQC and how it touches everyone, including the public. Okay, so just, just one of those building blocks of our conversation, um, EIS, you know, it, it, it throws fear into the hearts of any developer. It certainly threw fear into the hearts of the super ferry. It fixed their wagon pretty good. <laughs> That's because they didn't do it. That's because they didn't do it. <laughs> 
see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so the question now is exactly what it is. And I, I, just, I guess I'll begin with saying when I you know, graduated law school, my partner started, I want to tell you when that was, when I started practicing, there was no such thing, zero. And this all started at the federal level, and now we have it at the state level, and I mean, the state is just as interested in an EIS as the Fed is, and so, and it's, and it's, it's done usually what? By the person who wants to develop the project, and he hires people to do it. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, um, I thought this one diagram I thought I'd just show to folks okay. because there are plenty of projects, right? Okay. There are lots uh, of projects. Can you pull up the real one for that? Okay, we'll, we'll pull it up in a minute. Great. So there are many projects in the world, but there, under this law, there are certain triggers. So if you meet trigger, one of those triggers, trigger. right, right. So there's nine technical triggers. The most common one is the use of state or county money, probably, right? And so those are the That's ones. That's what happened in the Super Ferry. Right. Because they were using some $30 million to, to build something on the dock there. Right. And that was the trigger. Right. So many projects out there do not. Don't need it. Yeah. But the ones where there's a trigger, those would be subject to HRS 343. And within that category, there are some exemptions. So some things that are just, they don't need to do it, like repair and maintenance often mm -hmm. is not necessary. And then there are the projects also that might be subject to an exemption list. So if an agency has an exemption list or they make a determination that they don't need to do any environmental review because it's minor or it's under, on their list. That would be an example of a minor project. Yeah. Okay. So a driveway at this point, mm -hmm. um, you know, that would be exempt. Mm -hmm. And the agency has to go through a process to document that so the public can see that. Um, and so the developer has the comfort of knowing he's really exempt. Yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> no, you don't want to make a mistake about that. That's right. That to the bank. <laughs> the bank's going to want to know too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and then, go ahead. Oh no, I just wanted to also clarify that there's some real common sense things that you know are def are definitely exempt. Like the way the statute is written, it says any use of state or county lands or funds requires an environmental assessment except as otherwise provided. Well, anytime we buy paper clips or stationery for the state, it's obvious that you know it's not gonna have an environmental impact, so they don't even bother to document stuff like that. But in the continuum of actions, there's a certain point, which depends on the agency, where now they have to kind of seriously take a look at 343 to see if that particular action will have some kind of effect on the environment. The trigger again. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I mean, so there, there's a threshold level that, you know, each agency kind of has that, you know, where they determine, okay, this is a 343 issue. So it's agency by agency. Yeah. The agency that proposes the action, so we have two tracks, yeah. We have agency actions under 5B of the statute, and we have applicant actions under 5E. So the agency... 343. 343, yeah. And so agency actions are pretty routine. You know, agencies want to go build a road, you know, so they have to kind of look and say, well, should we do an EIS or can we, you know, do something, you know, like a Fonzie to just go ahead and build it? A Fonzie is not out of that old... Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. What's his name? Winkler, Happy Days. Winkler, Happy, Happy Days. days. <laughs> okay. A Fonzie is a finding <laughs> of no significant impact. Very yeah. good. Very good. <laughs> and so what happens is the Fonzie actually provides one of the three ways in which you can clear the process, yeah? The first being an exemption declaration like we talked about, then the finding of no significant impact, and finally the third way is to have an accepted EIS. So. Those are the three and different that's, ways. And that's the big kahuna right there. That is it. Accepted EIS. An accepted EIS. Okay. And so the what I wanted to say was that, yeah, this, so each, depending on the agency, you know, or the, whether it's an agency action or an applicant action, the there's certain procedural safeguards in place. Like for applicants, you have to preserve their due process rights, you know. You, you know, so they have to have a certain time to do things, and it has to be spelled out as to what will happen if they fail to do that, you know. And like... We have when, the statute up. We just saw that. Yeah. Yeah. When, you get, when you get the EIS, for example, for an applicant action, the, uh, the agency that's processing 
the acceptance of that document has 30 days under the statute to make sure that it's acceptable or not. If they fail to do that determination, there's a hammer provision in the law which says that it's automatically accepted by default. Oh, so it runs against the agency if That's they don't correct. do it in that 30 days. That's yeah. an important 30 days. That's day. a very important That's a 30 safeguard days. to a yeah. developer, I suppose. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Whereas in for agency actions, agencies that propose an action, they're not subject to that same kind of deadline, you know. Mm -hmm. So, which is one reason why you know it takes so long to. You know. So, if you're an agency, and you're a developer agency, so yeah. to speak, then the 30 days doesn't apply. It doesn't apply. So it's 60 days then. Uh, I'm only joking. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there, is, <laughs> there is no deadline. No, there is no deadline. That's why. So, so if you have an agency that wants to drag its heels. What do you do? Well, I mean... Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> well, it's we, unusual, though, yeah. for they these do, types of projects. Yeah, because they're the ones proposing the action yeah. in the first place. So yeah. usually it's because they have a lot of they know momentum. They yeah. yeah. Okay. Generally, we've you had... ever go out and bug them? So excuse I me, haven't. Excuse me, <laughs> boys and girls, but could you, I haven't. Could you please... Finish up. Finish yeah. up. No, and, I haven't. Yeah. You but should. you might. I might. I think that's on the power of implied <laughs> powers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Usually when an administration changes, you'll find that the, uh, the former administration tries to get all of their projects through the 343 mm. process because if it doesn't go through that, I mean, it's going to be dead. Yeah. You know? yeah. So they want to get it going, so then they yeah. try to finish. Okay, so um, just more on the EIS now. So an EIS is going to be written by an EIS, EIS writer. Mm -hmm. And they're usually, these days, I guess they're really long. Everything is really long these days. Longer and, and longer. And they have, to, they have to show that there is no significant impact. For, well, for in, a, in the case of an show? EIS, it already has been determined that there is significant impact. Yeah. What they need to do in the EIS is to disclose in detail, basically, the types of impacts, you know, what direct, indirect, or cumulative impacts that the action might have, okay. the alternatives, what kind of alternatives have they considered to this project, and, you know, which alternative will, you know, minimize, rectify, you know, all these adverse impacts. And then, so you, sh you show, or you disclose the impacts, mm -hmm. and then you show how you're going to ameliorate the impacts. That's correct. Yeah. So at the end of the day, there are no impacts that are left unameliorated. They're all covered somehow. They're covered, but then, of course, the law also re allows for unresolved issues to the extent that good faith attempts were made to try to resolve these issues. I mean, within the EIS process? That's correct. So like, for example, you know, <clears throat> one of the unresolved issues for the uh, rail project, which Governor Abercrombie accepted, you know, at the start of his administration was that they needed to s discuss the historic preservation aspects of that because it was not complete in the EIS. But it was an unresolved issue which they re they had to take before the uh, national, I mean the uh, Department of the Interior, and also to the state uh, <clears throat> historic preservation people. And so they did that, and of course, what happened was they got sued. But as far as the 343 process was concerned, the courts said, "No, it's okay." They went through the disclosure. They went through the process. But it's just that they found fault with their implementation of the 6E and the um, National Historic Preservation Act provisions, yeah? Compliance. Compliance, with, that's with correct. existing statute. Okay, well, let's, let's just go back to, so I, I'm an expert EIS writer. If somebody hires me, I write mm -hmm. the EIS, and I ad identify these various uh, environmental problems, issues, what have you. Uh, and then I show that, I, that we're going to do, we take steps to ameliorate them, so don't worry, okay? Um, now, somebody, and this is where I always get stuck on it. Uh, somebody has to say, you're right, Jay. We agree with you. This is a very reasonable analysis. So we're going to, what, accept your EIS? We're not going to make you go back and do it again. Who makes that decision? The agencies. Or the agency. in, in, in when the it's accepting the... authority, you know. Right. And essentially, the three criteria for acceptance, number one, they've complied with the procedural requirements. Second, they've complied with the content requirements. Third, is that they've complied with the public participation requirements. And That's like procedural. Yeah, so what happens is if all three of those are met, 
they really have no choice Let's but to accept the content. Then. Okay. Let's assume I dotted all my I's and crossed all my T's. Right. Dotted all my T's, crossed all my <laughs> Okay. But my content, you know, that wasn't so good. I mean, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense what I said. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what's going to happen? Somebody is going to say, no, no, Jay, you didn't do that right. It doesn't make sense. Who's going to say that? The agency. Yeah, the agency will make the decision. Um, actually, the accepting authority, whoever is accepting the EIS, will make the decision. In the case of an applicant action, it's the approving agency that will make that determination for the private applicant. Okay, now if you say, Jay, you didn't do it, we don't buy what you're saying. Yeah. You didn't identify something or you identified something and you didn't solve it. Right. Um, what, what happens then if they find that, if they find that I didn't do it a good job? Depends on the agency. They may what? what, what they may ask you to rewrite that or they may already tell you that, okay, you've submitted it and we have to go through the process of rejecting the EIS, which then affords you the opportunity under the statute to submit a revised draft EIS and go through the process again. Um, so until it's approved, it's all a draft anyway, right? Yeah. So it's negotiated. Yeah. Does somebody give me a call and say, Jay, you know, could you, could you do a little work on this? This doesn't really... Maybe. Doesn't, yeah. doesn't work. Okay. But if I do that, I have to make sure I comply with the procedure so mm -hmm. that the public knows that I've made a change mm -hmm. right. and I'm trying to fix it up. Mm -hmm. And one more question, then we'll go to a break, and that okay. is when I, when I make my statement of amelioration, when I make my statement what I'm going to do to deal with an identified problem, am I legally bound to do it? I think the public holds you accountable. The public will hold you accountable, but legally... The, the state courts, the, uh, there's appellate law on that, which says... It's a fair question, isn't it? No, no, it is. You're, the EIS process is only for disclosure, because unlike NEPA, where you have one agency, federal agency, which oversees the process from soup to nuts. NEPA yeah? is the National Environmental yeah. Protection Act. In HEPA, we don't have any one such agency. You have a whole bunch of agencies that have vested interests and they issue approvals for one particular action. And so what is going to happen is it depends on the agency. So if the agency feels that it hasn't complied, you know, then basically go back to square one again, you know. And they have documents that have been rejected at the state level, for example, for certain state projects, which I won't name, but, you know, they've come in for reiterations of maybe five reiterations because somehow when it got up to the governor's office they said it doesn't meet wow. the standards so and to think this didn't exist when i went to law school yeah it's that it's now up to uh, a science and an art okay jessica willie director of oeqc and les segundo uh, a, uh, a, a environmental health specialist at oeqc and we're talking about an inside view at oeqc here in hawaii the state of health uh, we'll be right back after this short break and we talk about public participation, which is what you guys really want to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll be right back. Hi, my name is Andrew Howard. I'm an astronomer at the Institute for Astronomy at the University of Hawaii up in Manoa. I'd like to tell you about the annual open house that we're having this year. It is on April 6th, 11 to uh, 4 p.m. It's an all ages event, kids, grown-ups, even uh, people in between, everyone is welcome. We have a lot of uh, really fun activities. You get to meet astronomers, look at yourself in an infrared camera, play with Legos, make robots, look at videos. Um, you can even make it, some of the kids like to make comets out of uh, gravel and, and, uh, and snow. Even adults like to do that too. You'll be able to look at the sun with a solar camera uh, safely. It's really a great activity. We do this every year um, in April, and I hope uh, to see you this year. Thanks. Okay, we're back. We're live with Jessica Woolley, Director of OEQC, the Office of Environmental Quality Control, and Les Segundo, who is a, um, uh, let's see, Environmental Health Specialist uh, with that office. Okay, and here we are on Hawaii, the State of Health, and we're talking about an insider view at OEQC. So one of the things, you know, that you guys care a lot about is the, is the involvement of the public. Okay, my first question is, why do you care so much about that? I think that the initial statute envisioned it being pretty much the whole point to integrate the public in the planning process. And so it's, it's, and at this point, 
because we don't really have that academic arm and not a huge government arm, the public is really the only one that's taking a close look at what's happening on the front so lines. So interesting. So this is an example of government opening the process up so the public can come in. Why? So the public can, um, can protect itself, can express itself. Mm -hmm. It's very democratic, too. It is really. very democratic, yeah. yeah, yeah. Especially in this area, especially in this state. At least to voice your issue, right. if not have a vote. <laughs> right, no vote, but a voice. Okay, yes. well, I mean, but some people, I suppose, they, they will express themselves, and if they don't like the result, they'll get a lawyer and file a lawsuit against somebody, right? No, we sue. People do, yeah, a lot of litigation around environmental yeah. uh, uh, impact statements. Too much. Okay, so I agree, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> if only we could get, you know, some satisfaction here. Um, so, okay, so how do you do that here in the, in the context of OEQC? You want to be completely open, transparent. You want the process to be inclusive for everybody who wants to come in. So they have that 30-day period, and you go out uh, in your notice to let them know that they can come in. What, how do they come in? What are they, what's their channel? They go on the website and file something? Uh, well, they can, well, usually for, for each environmental notice, it will specify the 30-day comment period beginning and where you submit your comments. Okay. So I think the critical part that people need to pay attention to is that environmental notice. And there are some organizations that I think try to get the word out, but I think because we primarily do electronic, I think a lot of times people don't know. So that is part of our job, is to try to get more people to know about the environmental notice. Hence our discussion today. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So you want them to be aware that there are these projects out there and that they can speak on these projects. And it uh, might be in their how? neighborhood. And, and, yeah. and it's not, I think one of the things I've heard sometimes from people is they're concerned that if they say something, it indicates that they want to litigate or that they don't like it. That's but not true. it's not true. It's, it's part of the planning process. And if you have issues or questions, that's your chance. This is just like, um, I don't know, bad, bad example, but the Liquor Commission wants to know what the people next door think about giving a license to a particular bar huh? uh, or a zoning uh, for a variance. Mm -hmm. They want to give people an opportunity in the neighborhood to speak up. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's the same thing here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jay, there's also one other thing too. Uh, the environmental impact statement rules provide an early consultation process, mm -hmm, that's right. which means that the applicant or the proposing agency, they're required to go out and let people know at the earliest practicable time of their plans. You know, in other words, what we call that, of course, is what talk story. They need to go out. You need to walk the streets. <laughs> <laughs> no, they need to go out actively to basically let people know How that. How do they do that? Well, there are many ways they can do it. They can do it through a letter. They can do it through in, informal face-to-face -face meetings, you know. There are many neighborhood ways, groups, neighborhood groups sort of and mm -hmm. stuff. But how about the neighborhood board? Ever oh, using it? yeah, it's that's a, a big part. Yeah, on Oahu, that's a very important yeah, part of the yeah, process. Yeah. But you know, they need to do that. So the early consultation process is supposed to be where everybody's supposed to try to get involved. So the permit ag permitting agencies will say, "Oh, we got to issue a permit for this action." So let's kind of chime in on this for for now, you know, or native Hawaiian groups or business organizations, developers and stuff, they need to all kind so of... So government agencies also yeah, that's are correct. coming around yeah. within that 30-day period. That's correct. And, and that Well, not 30-day, but the con early consultation period. Early that's, consultation That's period. Okay. Before, the, before a document... Before it goes out to yeah, the 30 days. Mm -hmm. bef that's before a document is even prepared. It's okay. often before they really have a concrete vision for what they're going to do. It might be mm -hmm. the initial stage. They're planning, they're thinking, and the early consultation. So, and that's very healthy because mm -hmm. that means that by the time they get to the the final of it, mm -hmm. they've they've had preliminary discussions with mm -hmm. people, yep. and they're not they're not they're probably going to avoid making some mistakes yep. that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's yeah. the hope is that they can avoid mistakes and make better decisions. And that you know, you, I, if if I remember right about you facilitating this, you you would welcome that. You would you would put them together. You mm -hmm. would want them yep. to have this early planning discussion. Yeah, and we'll sometimes facilitate it and promote it. And, and, and that, among other things, is a way to facilitate by avoiding controversy either mm -hmm. in the 30-day period or in the rebuttal or 
later in the courts. That's correct. Uh, so if everybody's on the same page early on, mm -hmm. uh, then hopefully you can avoid that. The yeah. sooner people talk, the better. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay, so now, um, how about an individual person like Joe, the rag man, who just feels strongly about it and he has nothing else to do and he sees this and he wants to make a comment, he, he can do this just as well as ABC Big Corporation the same way. That's correct. Right. Okay. And, and how, and how, does it, how does it affect, I mean, what, what's the effect of that statement, the effect of the expression by the public? Who is going to be, you know, influenced by it and how? Well, there will be a response. So whatever the comment or question is, there has to be a response. By, by the developer person. By the, yeah. the applicant, applicant or so. the agency, whichever it is. Okay. And so that's very valuable. Every single comment Every has single to be comment, yeah. That sounds, could be pretty tedious if you've got 10,000 comments. Well, well, there are some rules to try to <laughs> allow for it to be consolidated when it's clear that, you know, it's the same question yeah. over and over again or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. But like for EAs, a, EAs, for example, they, you can just you just have to respond to the respondent now. You don't have to give a detailed response, whereas in an EIS, you're required for every point that's raised, you have to respond to that point. point, point, point. Quickly, an EA. We, we haven't mentioned that. The acronym hasn't oh, come up. Oh, sorry, environmental but assessment. We, yeah, environmental assessment. It's not quite an EIS. What's uh -huh. the difference? Well, the, the EA is generally the document that an agency approving agency or a proposing agency would use to determine, well, you know what, we don't think this is going to have significant impact, but we want to, we have to let the public know this is what our initial so our inclination, our our inclination. Is, is that there is no impact. Yeah, and so what's so we happen? don't need an EIS. Right, so the public has 30 days to go and say, wait a minute, there's a royal burial site here, you know, or, you know, we found a whole bunch of bones here, you know, and so, you know, they it's their, their chance to basically chime in and to let the agency know that there is a red flag out there, yeah? And generally... So if you get through it, I mean, if, it's a, if your EA is accepted, then you don't have to file for an EIS. No, you don't. You and actually... If it's get, not accepted, that then, means you have to start at, with an EIS. That's correct. So do people go the EA route or they just say, ah, let's just do an EIS? They go both, but it's very rare for someone to come up, generally because of the early consultation period, you're gonna know right off the bat what the public thinks. You know, they're gonna, if you know, if you're gonna, they're gonna significant concerns pop up. You're gonna know right off the bat that yeah, maybe I should go in EIS because I don't want these people to sue me in court. You know, you know, Just testing the water. Yeah, in a couple instances, there, very rarely, you have an agency or an applicant preparing saying, oh, we don't think we're gonna have to do an EIS. Then something happens during the public comment period which now raises the significance level. And in those rare cases, they end up doing an EIS, which means they other, uh, undergo another 30-day common period to have the people speak on the well, scope of the EIS. Sometimes these can get mired down. I mean, yeah. I mean, for example, you say that if Superferry had filed properly, which they didn't do, that's another show, um, if they had properly filed an EIS, uh, they would have been better off for sure, but that doesn't mean that they would have gotten their project through either, because if there's all kinds of tumult and mm -hmm. controversy, you know, if people didn't believe them on the whales, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or on the berries on the shoe issue, um, they would have got stopped on that. Mm -hmm. So there's no guarantee, is there? There's no guarantee, and, and at the end of the day, it's often the agencies who make the final determination, so it would be up to that agency and most often there's momentum and responsiveness by the proponent of the project to the public concerns so usually you don't see projects rejected but definitely anytime it can be it's they part don't. of the fabric of our society mm -hmm. yeah. now for sure yeah. especially in an island state concerned about the environment and so sometimes it's political sometimes oh, they yeah. just decide they're not going to make the money because it's too politically controversial. Yeah, and right. So you going to make a call, a judgment right, call. Right. So my question to you, we, we're, we're about done. Sorry, I wish we had more time. This is very educational. I'm so glad you guys came down. Thank you. So what in this job do you hope to do? 
What kinds of changes and visions do you have in your mind, Jessica? Many, many, <laughs> but I, I will say one of the biggest at this point is making the law clearer for everybody both, you know, for everybody, agencies, applicants, and the public. I think there's so much confusion that that is really my biggest job, is trying to help everybody understand how the law works and to make sure it's functioning properly. This is my last, my very last final question. You guys will come down again, right? Talk about this some more, yeah? I'd be happy to. Yeah, yeah thank happy you. To. Yeah, to yeah. Take you at temperature once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk super fair. <laughs> It'll yeah. be fun. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>